Would you like the answer? I don't know. Well, you could put other. <laughs> Just give it your best shot. I'm not going to give you a grade. <laughs> you get no units for this. <laughs> Okay, which two are you stuck between? Poverty and lack of education. All right. Which one came to mind first, if one? I saw poverty first. Okay. <laughs> My name's Tony, by the way. My name's Allie. Hello. Hi, Allie. Have we <laughs> met before? No. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, why do you think that's the main problem? I don't know, because I feel like lack of education is also part of the issue. Okay. Because, like, people don't realize, like, the situations that others are in. Okay. Which, like, leads to poverty because, like, they aren't able to, like, assist or, like, help. Well, you know, it's, it's certainly easy for us in America to kind of be clueless yeah. as to what poverty's like. Yeah. Now, granted, we have people who live in poverty. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall what the percentage is. I don't know if it's about 10%. 11%, don't quote me on that. But, I mean, there's certainly a percentage of people in our country that, according to the standards in our country, live in poverty. But I think statistically it also shows that many of the people in our country who are considered impoverished are wealthier than 99% of the people in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, so, I mean, I've, I've, spent, I've spent some time in Kenya, uh, in the Nairobi area, and... Uh, I've seen, uh, I've gotten a taste, in a sense, of poverty at a level I wouldn't experience here in the United States. So, so, so how do you see lack of education and poverty going hand in hand because as far as the main problem in like, the world? One thing is that a lack of education can lead to poverty because, like, they can't get, like, jobs that, like, pay well or, like, okay. um, like, um, learn how to like fix the conditions that they're living in, like okay. say like water sources and things like that. All right. And then like poverty can lead to lack of education because they can't afford the education, or like they don't live in like places where they can like get an education. Sure. Or like they have to spend the entire day like getting resources and like water sources and like food. Got it. Rather yeah. Rather than going. Sure. To yeah, I I see validity yeah. in in all of what you said. What's interesting though is that uh, what what are you studying, Allie? Um, cinema. Cinema. <laughs> yeah. What what aspect of it? Um, I mostly like a fiction portion, like of cinema. Okay. But what do you hope to do with your degree? Um, either like I want to like get involved in like cinematography, um, like sound design. Okay. So like. So um, pre and post production type work yeah. behind the camera. Yeah. Okay. My, uh, my uh, youngest daughter, Amanda, she's 24, third year student here. What year are you? Um, I'm a second year student. Okay. So she's a third year English major. Um, she had had aspirations of being a film archivist. Um, uh, she has just this photographic memory for old films during the Hayes Code and, you know, 30s to 50s. And, and uh, now she's kind of moved towards... Uh, uh, museum curating and that kind of thing, but you said cinema and it, made, it <laughs> automatically made me think of her. So that field that you want to get into, tough. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, you know, and, and I hope you do well with it. I mean, I, you know, that's, I, I don't want to discourage, <laughs> I don't want to discourage you. But the reality though is that there are, there are, there are people here who um, make come out of four years here with no debt whatsoever because of either scholarships um, or grants or parents who can afford their, sense, their, their <laughs> kids to school, right? Um, there are also students who are going to come out of here with $100,000 in debt. Um, some of them are going to graduate with very, very specific high-level educations in very impacted fields. And some of them are going to be working for seven fifty an hour at McDonald's, saying, "Would yeah. you like some fries with that?" Right. So, in that sense, you, Allie, <laughs> who are going to walk away from here with an education at, you know, I guess what would be considered an Ivy League school of the Midwest, 
right? I mean, one of the best universities in the Midwest. You're going to walk away with a four-year degree, right? Um, with aspirations to maybe pursue more education or go directly into your field. No guarantee of that, yeah. right? So even being highly educated, you may struggle to make enough money to survive. Yeah. Right? So, so while I agree with you that that someone with no education might have a tougher time in some parts of the world than a person who's well educated, a good education is no guarantee that people aren't going to struggle financially. Yeah. Right? Um, I would say sin. Imagine that, huh? <laughs> Walk up here, see the cross. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, w when I say the word sin, what what comes to mind? What is there a definition that rattles in your head, or do you um, have any kind of religious background or anything? Or so I'm not really religious. I'm probably like agnostic. Okay. But like sin is just like morally wrong things. I guess like okay. Just like a lack of consideration for like basic humanity. Okay. I guess. All right. Okay. Um, I would agree with, with what you just said. I, I, no, I, I would. Um, you know, I'm not trying to patronize you or anything, but that my hat is completely on wrong. My hat is on sideways. I'm thinking, why is everybody looking at me this way today? That was stupid. Uh, um, I agree with you. Um, you know, Jesus said that the two greatest commandments were to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. I think the reason there's poverty in the world is because we don't love our neighbors ourselves. Yeah. And and Ali, I would include the Christian evangelical church in that. If if the American evangelical church, as gluttonously wealthy as it is, truly loved its neighbor as itself, we wouldn't need social programs. We wouldn't need government in for intervention. The body of Christ, the church would be loving their neighbor and there wouldn't be poverty in the world. Yeah, like the world's main problem is basically that people like don't consider other human beings. They're like very self-absorbed and so it just creates problems. Yeah. So like that's one of the reasons why we do need like some sort of intervention because like humans are like naturally like self-absorbed and like do mm -hmm. not care for others, Sure. I guess. So throughout the history of humanity, um, and we could debate how long that is, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Throughout the history of humanity, up until 2018, how have we done? Lots of murder, lots of genocide. Very... I don't know, man. And a lot of it, <laughs> and a lot of it, a lot of that, um, although statistically it would show that, that more atheistic civilizations have butchered people than religious civilizations, there can be no argument that religious civilizations have also failed to love their neighbor as herself with butchery. Okay, there's no there's no doubt about that. It would be disingenuous for me to just say it's all atheism. Okay, it's, um, it's not. The, the point of that question, Allie, was the fact that from the time Adam and Eve disobeyed God, ate that, he gave them one rule. <laughs> one rule! I mean, think about how many rules you have to live by just being on this campus. I mean, it's, it's like that. It's like that meme now today. You were given one job, right? You were given one job. Don't eat from that tree. Not any tree. Not all trees. That one tree. So prideful and arrogant were they, though, to say, "No, I don't have to obey God." They ate the tree, and and the world went to hell in the handbasket. Sin and death entered into the world. Very first crime recorded is one brother killing another, Cain and Abel, right? And here we are, 2018 with uh, institutions, fine institutions, of higher learning throughout the world. We have, there's seven billion people in the world and they're not all educated, but we got a lot of educated people in the world, right? We've got a lot of religious people in the world too. And we still have poverty today, right? It's sin, it's sin, it's, it, Sin is a, technically, sin is a violation of God's law. You and I were created in the image of God. We're very different. Um, you have pretty hair. <laughs> I don't. Um, I'm old enough to be your dad, right? You want to go into cinema, I'm a retired street cop. We're very, very different. 
but we were both created by the same God. And as a result, you and I have two things in common, maybe more, but two things certainly. We both know God exists because he's written that reality on our heart. His creation testifies to that. Many people will look at that and ignore it, but he's also given us a conscience. You and I know the difference between right and wrong, though we were raised differently, different generations, different places. You and I both know it's wrong to lie, for instance. Maybe your parents taught you that. There are a lot of kids who grow up in criminal families that say, son, you lie to everybody. Don't trust anyone and don't give them a reason to trust you. You lie, you do whatever you have to do to get ahead. That's real, that's a reality, right? But even children who are raised that way know in their hearts that it's wrong to lie because they were created in the image of God and the God who made them isn't a liar. You and I know it's wrong to steal. It would be wrong for me to steal your backpack, I'm not. And it would be wrong for you to steal mine, I'm confident you won't. <laughs> but we both know it's wrong. Not because we got caught before um, and we got punished, but because the God who made us isn't a thief like we are. We know it's wrong to see a person in need and have the ability, look, everybody, everybody does not necessarily have the ability to meet the need of a homeless person sitting on the street, right? More often than not, we just don't have the time, which is sin. But not everybody has the ability to pick someone up off the street and change their life, okay? But we know in our hearts, because we were created in the image of God, to love our neighbor, we know that if we have the ability to meet someone's need, we ought to do it. But because of our love of self, and because of selfishness, we say no. I want that latte. <laughs> I've got a $10 Starbucks gift card in my pocket, and that's going to be my lunch. He should go to work. He doesn't need it, right? I mean, that's selfishness. That's sin. And so the, I believe that's why we have poverty. Um, I believe, you know, certainly that's why we have crime. I believe that's why we, um, I mean, you, I'm sure you heard about what happened in, in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. And I don't know if you heard or not, but one of the women who was murdered 97 years old, survived the Holocaust in World War II, only to be murdered by a neo-Nazi in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 30 minutes from my hometown where I was raised. You know, um, there's evil in the world, uh, no doubt. Um, and that's because of sin. You know, and while, while you and I may never even fathom the thought of going into a synagogue and gunning people down because of our sin nature we have the propensity for that and this is how um, have you ever without acting upon it maybe even saying anything about it have you ever thought that you know what i think i hate that person yes. yeah i have too i have too um and some ways i've tried to justify it in my own mind you know and other ways were just completely unjustifiable but God in his word says whoever hates another person is a murderer because murder begins in the heart moves to the mind where we formulate a plan whether that plan is to act out physically or to say something hateful and then moves to the hand or the mouth where we carry out the act now it may never have to get to step three but God sees the murder already taking place because he judges our hearts. So, Ali, what do you think about that? That if you were to die today, and I hope you live 80, 90, 100 more years, if you were to die today and stand before God, based on what you said about yourself, that he would see you as a murderer at heart. Yeah. I'm probably... If heaven does exist, I'm probably not going to end up in it. Okay. Does that concern you? Honestly. Mm, not really, just because like I don't have like that belief system like okay. ingrained in me. Okay. But like if I did then yeah, yeah, okay. I would be concerned. So Ali, what do you think's more important? What we believe or whether or not what we believe is true? I feel like it depends on like how you act on it. Okay. Well let let's um okay. But let's let's stick to just that 
tiny question. Um, uh, because people act on beliefs that are wrong all the time. Yeah. That man who, and, I, and I'm hard pressed to call him that, um, better put, that coward who went into that synagogue and gunned down those people, believed what he was doing was right. Is it true that what he was doing was right? No. No, abs I 110% agree with you. There was nothing right about what he did. See, and you and I know that instinctively, again, because we were created in the image of God, we know that murder is wrong because the God who created us is not a murderer at heart like so many of us are. And so in the end, Ali, what's more important is whether or not what we believe is true. I could believe that you are the starting, starting quarterback for the Hawkeyes. <laughs> I could believe it with all my heart. He, he had a rough weekend. Didn't do real well against Penn State. Um, he's a good quarterback. But I could walk up to you and say, hey, tough game, but you're a great quarterback. <laughs> well, what are you talking about? Well, you're the starting quarterback for the Hawkeyes. No, I'm not. I'm a second year cinema <laughs> student named Ali. No, 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 no. You're about, I don't know how tall he is, but you're about 6'2", 220. Um, man. I believe it with all my heart. <laughs> it's never going to be true, right? You're always going to be, well, maybe not always be young, but you're always going to be a lady named Allie, no matter what I believe about you, right? Same is true about God, Allie. It doesn't matter what we believe in the end. What matters is whether or not what we believe is true. And again, God has written the reality of his existence on our hearts. Many of us, and I did for a time, many of us simply suppress that truth by our unrighteousness. And the reason we do that is the thought of submitting to the God we know is anathema to us. It's ugly to us. It's a, no, no, no. I'm going to be the captain of my own destiny. I'm going to be the final authority. I'm going to make all of my own decisions. I'm not going to be answerable to God. That's part of our rebellion. That's what Adam and Eve did, you know, in the garden. And, and mankind hasn't changed a bit. And that's why we have poverty, right? So do you have any idea what God did? so that when you stand before him, instead of receiving justice, instead of receiving judgment for your sins against him, you could receive forgiveness. Confession? Nope, no, um, and this is why. Um, again, I was a deputy sheriff for 20 years, and uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, uh, <laughs> as an attorney before he became president, he said, any man who goes into court to defend himself has a fool for a client. Okay, and I saw that happen many times as a deputy sheriff. Guys, um, uneducated, many of them, not all, some very educated, but th so prideful, so arrogant, even though they're guilty of committing the crime, they say, I don't need an attorney. I'm just going to go in and convince the jury and the judge that I'm innocent, that Deputy Miano is wrong, and I'm innocent, and they're going to let me go. And it never worked out, okay? So let's say, let's say Allie committed a crime. Well, probably unlikely. No, but just hypothetically. So Ali commits a crime. She gets caught. It's uh, not a case of mistaken identity. It's, it's not a, a corrupt police officer or judicial system. It's not 12 people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty and making a dumb decision. Ali actually committed the crime. And so the judge says to you, Ali, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, Your Honor, I'm guilty. I confess that I broke the law. And because I confessed, I think you ought to let me go. Is the judge going to let you go? No. No, in fact, your confession seals your guilt, right? As a, as a detective uh, with uh, juvenile crime and gangs for a number of years, um, I, I sought confessions from people. I would, I would record the conversations. I would, I would have them write in their own words, you know, with pen and pencil or, uh, and paper, um, their confession. And I would take that to court as evidence. Look, I have physical evidence here. We got videotape. We saw him go into the store. We saw him steal, steal the six pack of beer. And look, he, he's confessed. He wasn't coerced. We have it all recorded. There was no threats made to him or anything like that. No false promises. Yeah, detective, yeah, okay. My buddies dared me to steal a six pack and I stole a six pack. Okay. That confession doesn't make him innocent. It doesn't exonerate him. It seals his guilt. So no, it's not confession. So let's stay in the courtroom just for a minute. And, and I really appreciate your time, thank you. Um, so 
Ali is convicted of a crime, but this time it's a death penalty case. Ali's confessed doesn't help her, convinces the jury you're guilty. The judge says, Ali, because of your guilt, I sentence you to death. Unlike here in America where uh, death row inmates get 10 to 20 years to appeal their case and free food and medical care and housing on our taxpayer dollars for all that time, they're going to escort you to an adjoining room, they're going to strap you to a gurney, and they're going to put you to sleep like a stray dog. No appeals, nothing. Okay? And again, just to take all of the, the, the social nuances out of it, you are guilty, right? Because you and I both know that there have been people sentenced to death who weren't guilty, okay? So it's a fallible system, but not in your case, all right? So just as they're about to take you next door and put you to death, the judge, who's found you guilty, and rightly so, stands up from behind his bench, takes off his robes of authority, he steps down and says, Ali, you're guilty, you deserve to die, and I'm gonna take your place. The law requires that a death sentence be carried out. I'm going to have the death sentence I imposed upon you carried out on me. And you will be declared innocent by the court. Not because you didn't commit the crime, but because someone else paid the penalty for you. What would you think of that judge? Kind of a little, little, not un, like, you think he's crazy? A little crazy, but like also very self-sacrificial for okay. other people. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, good. That's a picture of what God did. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, God the Father sent his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, and without sin. Uh, unlike you and me who break God's law every day in thought, word, or deed one way or another, he never sinned. He lived a perfect life for some 33 years as God in the flesh that you and I can't live for 33 seconds. And then at a time appointed before the foundation of the world, he voluntarily went to a cross. He suffered and died a death he did not deserve to take upon himself the punishment lawbreakers like you and me rightly deserve for our sins against God, for the times when we've done nothing about poverty, for the times when we've selfishly loved ourselves more than someone else, for the times when we've lied or stolen or, or denied his existence or taken his name in vain. He took upon himself that punishment that we rightly deserve through the shedding of his own blood, innocent blood. And then he forever defeated sin and death when he rose from the grave. And what God requires of us in response, Ali, uh, same thing he requires of you, me, and every other human being, is that by faith we receive that sacrifice, that gift that Jesus Christ gave on the cross, and by faith receive him as our Lord and our Savior. And the promise is that if God does that work in us, and it is a work of God, it's not a religious work, it's not trying to bribe God with good works, it's not trying to bribe God by ending of poverty, you know, I, I, um, it's, not, it's not trying to earn merit with God by helping a homeless person. It's entirely through faith in what his son did on behalf of sinners like us. And the promise is, is that if he does that work in us, our sins will be forgiven. Not on the basis of anything we did to earn it, but on the basis of what his son did to pay that penalty that we rightly owe to God. We'll have the assurance of forgiveness will be reconciled to the God, the judge of the universe we've spent our whole life offending, even if we never gave it a thought, and we'll have the assurance of eternal life, again on the basis of what someone else did on our behalf. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so I talked a lot. <laughs> I'm going to give you the last word. What do you think? Don't know. Okay. So give it some thought. Yeah? Right? Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Allie. Really good talking to you. Do well with your studies. Take care.